Hello and welcome to this edition of Frozen Cups and Hot Chips. I'm your host, Terrell Ducree. Of course, another segment lined up, a supreme segment. We've got Ashley Cota, an international marine biologist, along with James McCombs uh, and our Frozen Cups and Hot Chips podcast production crew in conjunction with A-Shaw Production with an exclusive piece uh, to add to our album here at Frozen Cups and Hot Chips. Uh, we were on location and had to grab Ashley before she left out to go into international waters. And you're going to love this segment. A marine biologist covering uh, all over the world, but making sure that we protect our environment. Enjoy this segment. James, take it away. Hi, good evening. We're here with Ashley Coda. And so, Ms. Coda, we're here tonight just to talk to you about um, who you are and, and your experiences where you've been so far, um, being the, the, the young, beautiful chick that you are. Right, but but in your life, you you've, you're doing things that most women aren't doing. So if you can, uh, just give us a brief history of where you started, right, from grade school uh, forward, and, and then what you're doing now to make a difference in environmental studies. Awesome. So hi, I'm Ashley Coda, and um, I started my passion for the ocean very young. As a family, we would always go to the beach on the weekends or any day that was possible. We'd boogie board with the dolphins out at the north end of the Virginia Beach oceanfront, and I would search for little creatures in the rock pools down by the rock jetties. And I do have a lot to credit to my dad, Glenn Coda. He was a oceanographer with a polar emphasis. So he definitely instilled a huge desire inside of me to explore the oceans. And although he passed away when I was younger, I still hold that desire deep in my heart. And it intrigues me to go on these adventures that I do and search for ways to help conserve and protect the oceans. When I was super young, we would go to the beach, we would comb for seashells or sand fiddlers or little isopods in the sand, whatever we could find. And I remember being super distraught when I was young because my parents wouldn't let me bring a starfish home, or a sea star actually, they're not fish, but wouldn't let me bring a sea star home and keep in our home aquarium because it was too delicate of a species and too hard to take care of. So even as a little kid, I was an explorer. I dreamed to travel all around the world, and that's still in progress, as I'm still quite young. <laughs> but throughout my life, I always thrived in biology and the sciences. I always wanted to be a marine biologist. And throughout my years, I just spent my time kind of studying fish and different creatures in the ocean and oceanography as well, the features of the ocean. But when I was in high school, it was really a turning point for me. So when I was in high school, I started to volunteer at the Virginia Aquarium. And I learned so much about our local ecosystems and ecosystems that are far away from us as well. And I really got to experience a lot of cool creatures and learn fun facts. And that's actually where I got the basis of my knowledge and all of my fun facts that I travel with and spew to everyone nowadays. So I really thank the Virginia Aquarium for allowing me to spend over 300 hours there talking to visitors. But after the Virginia Aquarium, what I did is I went on a three-week journey to the Windward Islands. So I started up in St. Lucia, and then I was on a catamaran, and I went from St. Lucia to St. Vincent, throughout the Grenadines, and then down to Grenada. And that was on a summer camp called Odyssey Expeditions. And that's where I really got to have a hands-on experience for the first time with marine biology. We did cool things like invertebrate studies, we did fish identification, we did dissections and plankton trawls and lectures every day on different species or different reproductive strategies that fish have. And that was kind of my turning point where like, yes, this is where I should be. I want to continue on this path. I want to pursue it as a career and a lifestyle. And so I graduated from Norfolk Collegiate in 2013. And when I graduated, I left five days after to go to Mozambique, Africa. Over in Mozambique, Africa, I was working with Dr. Andrea Marshall, Dr. Simon Pierce, and the Marine Megafauna Foundation. And when I was over there, I got to do hands-on research with manta rays, whale sharks, and sea turtles. 
and that really solidified everything. I was hooked on it. I didn't even want to go to college anymore. I was like, mom, just send my tuition money over here. I'm just going to stay here and be a researcher. Unfortunately, that's not a realistic dream. Um, you do need some background in the sciences and marine biology in order to be a successful researcher. So after spending five weeks in Mozambique studying those whale sharks and manta rays, I decided to go to UNCW for college. And through UNCW, I did complete my Bachelor's of Science in Marine Biology. And from there, I've been traveling the world ever since. So I did, before actually, I did my bachelor's, I ended up going to Roatan, Honduras and did a dive master internship. And while I was doing my dive master internship, I got to work on some coral conservation projects down there and really learned how to speak to the customers, really noticing that they pick up and are influenced by what I say. So I discovered that I could spread my conservation messages through diving. And after I did my dive master, I ended up going to Ecuador. I went to Puerto Lopez in Isla de la Plata with the marine megafauna once again. And I was a volunteer research assistant where I got to work hands-on with giant manta rays and was able to tag a few, was able to take tissue samples and really made a big difference in the world. And I really ex was excited about that, um, getting to do that hands-on stuff. And after I went to Ecuador, I became a scuba instructor. Life wasn't always easy for me, so when I got the opportunity to become a scuba instructor and kind of put my studies to the side for a bit, I decided to take that opportunity. And when I was going to UNCW and studying marine biology, I became a scuba instructor and was able to teach other people how to dive, which allows them to explore that underwater world. And exploring the underwater world is the closest you can get to marine conservation. So, so with that, you, but you have certain certifications that make you a little bit elite to the civilian community, do you not? Absolutely. So I do have a degree in marine biology. Mm -hmm. And I also am a IDC staff instructor what does for that PADI. Mean? So that's a scuba instructor. Okay. But what does IDC mean? To IDC us? means instructor development course. Okay. So at this moment, I could teach anyone from Discover Scuba, which is just learning how to dive, the very basics, resort dive, you could call it. Okay. I could teach anyone from their first breath underwater up into assistant instructor. And I do have dreams to become a course director at some time in my life. <laughs> Just costs a little bit of money to get there. <laughs> right, got it, got it. Yeah. So yeah. that's in the yeah. distant future. But for now, I'm really enjoying the public conservation aspect where I can take what I know and what I believe in and just tell the everyday diver how they can help with ocean conservation, whether it's using a reusable water bottle or a metal straw or saying no to single-use plastics. All of that makes an impact. If I'm teaching a 10-year-old kid how to scuba dive, that's something where they are going to appreciate the underwater world more than most humans do. Not very many people ever get the chance to scuba dive or free dive or experience that underwater world firsthand. So it's really special for me to be able to connect people with the world that I love mm -hmm. and have them enjoy it as well. Mm -hmm. cool. So, but now I know in your diving experiences, I have been told that you can dive 100 feet. I can free dive 100 feet. Ah. It doesn't happen often. It's not my regular, but I have been down 100 feet. Yeah. Comfortably, I'll go 60 to 70 feet and can spend about a minute and a half or a minute and 45 seconds underwater, just on one breath. Right. And that's something that I really am keen to work on. Is there techniques that you use in that? Absolutely. So in free diving, a lot of it is controlling your heart rate and it's very much mind over matter. So you do certain breathing techniques. For example, you'll do two seconds in and 10 seconds out. And that will help lower your heart rate. And then before you do your dive, you'll do what is called a purge breath. 
and you never want to do more than four of those. So you'll do one second in, four seconds out. And that helps lower the carbon dioxide in your body so that you don't actually have the urge to breathe as quickly. Because the urge to breathe is not because of lack of oxygen, it's because of buildup of carbon dioxide. But I do not recommend anyone to free dive without proper training because it can be very dangerous. Shallow water blackout is a real problem. So Ashley, you got to tell me, what's been your most interesting uh, project, environmental protection project? So my most interesting project, James, was actually when I was over in the Cook Islands. This was the first time I was over there a few years ago and I had an offer to help out with a rat eradication project on an uninhabited island. So I teamed up as the project manager for the Pacific Island Conservation Initiative and I teamed up with the BirdLife International team and the Te Upukaria Society. We took a cargo boat through the South Pacific for about five days where we landed in Suwaro, which is one of the uninhabited islands in the Cook Islands. It's also the Cook Islands only national park. Suwaro is an important nesting site for Pacific seabirds and they have an invasive rat species over there. So our job was to go and eradicate that rat species. And I know that sounds a little gruesome, but it was actually quite entertaining. So we went up there and we took machetes and compasses to cut tracks throughout the island, creating a grid line. And every 25 meters, we placed a bait point. So at those bait points, once the entire island was covered, we would go out and throw rat poison in a uniformed manner so that we would cover every square inch of that island. We replicated it about two weeks later in order to ensure that we killed every single rat. I will admit that we've been about two years now with zero rats seen in Suwaro, which is a huge accomplishment, not only for us as a team, but for the Pacific seabirds. Um, we're really happy that their nesting populations are going to be undisturbed, and things like the brown booby, the red-footed booby, the masked booby, and the city terns and the frigate birds, they're all going to be able to peacefully lay their eggs, make their nests without worrying about those rats. Sure. Not only was it a lot of fun killing rats in Suwaro, but there's also a very special place inside their lagoon. Their lagoon goes down to about 80 meters. Sure. It's also an atoll just like Manahiki, the other island that I worked in in the Cook Islands. And Suwaro has a group of resident manta rays. Okay. The manta rays there are very intriguing to me because majority of them are what we call melanistic, okay. which would be a black manta. Okay. So you normally have a manta that's black on top, right. white on bottom with black spots. Okay. And each manta is identified as an individual by the unique spot pattern on their bellies. Wow. Just like a human has a unique fingerprint, that's how you can tell them apart. Okay. Over there, majority of the manta rays that I saw were melanistic. And melanistic manta rays only make up a small fraction of the global population of mantas. So in my future studies, I definitely plan on heading back to Saguaro and doing tissue samples, stable isotope analysis, all sort of genetic studies on these manta rays and even tagging studies where we do either acoustic or satellite telemetry in order to figure out if these manta rays are a subspecies or if they're just an isolated population which is causing the predominantly melanistic um, tone for them. So I'm really excited about that one. So now as you move forward, what is your goal and what you see as far as marine biology and what you can do for the environment, but also for kids who want to come in and be part of this to make an impact. So my future goals are still quite unclear. I know that I want to do something magnificent for the ocean, but I plan on focusing my needs in the places that are most dire of need. So right now I plan on going to Barbados where I will be helping out with a coral conservation project and hopefully helping out with the 
preliminary planning for a new marine protected area, and also teaching scuba diving. So I'll get to see the general public that comes out diving and get to share my knowledge of the underwater world with them and hopefully get them inspired that they want to save that world as well. In the future, I'm really hoping to do more recycling projects. Okay. Uh, recently, I was in the Cook Islands. I got to participate in a project on Manahiki, okay. which is one of the northern group Cook Islands. It's a small atoll with only about 170, 180 people on it at a time. And they are famous for their black pearl farming. Oh, wow. So the black pearls are a huge export in the Cook Islands. The Queen of England wears black pearls yep. from Manahiki. Yep. However, their lagoon that they farm the black pearls in is struggling right now. And the reason for that is the buildup of trash. So what they do is they have cargo boats that come up every four to six months, and those cargo boats will leave goods. Shampoo, conditioner, beer, water, wine, food, anything that a daily person might need. Beer and wine. Exactly, yep. and unfortunately, um, all of those goods, once they're discarded of, are buried in unlined pits and then either burned or just buried completely. Oh, wow. So all of that rubbish is now being leached into the lagoon, causing negative effects on the health of the lagoon, right. and even more important, negative effects on the people that populate those islands. Okay. So my recent project was actually over in Manahiki to build a sorting and repackaging facility for the island. Wow. So we yeah. took over supplies to build a little shed where we could house the goods and what we had was a glass crusher, a can crusher, a paper and cardboard crusher, and also something to crush the plastic bottles. And so we're crushing all of the aluminum, the tin, the cans, we're crushing the plastic, the paper, and then we have a um, contract with the Cook Islands Inner Island Shipping Companies where they will pick up those bales of plastic and everything of that sort yeah. and they're going to remove that from the island and send it to New Zealand for proper recycling Great. rather than burning it and having it leach right. into the yeah. groundwaters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we're happy about that. That yeah. was a big yeah. project that's still in the works right yeah. now. Yeah. And I do hope to return to the Cook Islands in order to s replicate that project okay. in the other Cook Islands that may need it as well. Young marine biologists, I would request that you guys go out and talk to people. Put yourself out there. I had to bother Dr. Andrea Marshall for months before she allowed me to come to Africa and volunteer for her. And I regret nothing from that because it was the gateway to opening up my entire life. I truly believe that if you put yourself out there and you have passion, whether you have the knowledge behind it or you have the experience behind it, if you show that you care and you're willing to work for it, someone will give you a chance and it could just be the right person. What a magnificent segment. Kudos again to both Ashley Coda and James McCombs for stepping in for Frozen Cups and Hot Chips to provide that exclusive segment. And wow, I mean, did you see the footage, the pictures? Uh, shout out to HR Production and Company along with Ashley Coda for providing that extra B-roll. But I mean, she is phenomenal. Uh, and of course, we only speak to the best and brightest. And Frozen Cups is just beginning 2021. Um, we are marking and charting our own path and of course the sky is the limit we appreciate the support um, we're getting you know love and buzz all over the town and when you see what we have coming up next you're really going to know that rail is asking that real and providing tide water with a voice that we've never really had before thank you so much again ashley thank you james i'm terrell and this is frozen cups and hot chips. Yeah.